Well, dobre utra, and we have made it! Finally, 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 I am in Tashkent, the largest city in Central Asia and the capital of Soviet Central Asia. And here's the thing, there's a lot of videos online about Tashkent, all the things that you can do here, especially people transiting through this city to visit other important places in Uzbekistan like Samarkand, Bukhara. But actually, I don't want to follow in their footsteps. I want to do something quintessentially, well, Soviet. And we are actually starting in front of the most Soviet landmark imaginable, the hotel that I'm staying in, the Hotel Uzbekistan. So to be fair, considering that we're starting here, the rest of the tour might be totally downhill from here, but we're going to do our best regardless. Let's go check out this incredible city of about 3 million people. Well, first things first, happy birthday, Hotel Uzbekistan. Not necessarily today, but this year, the hotel is turning 50 years old. And actually, that means it opened back in 1974. Now, it was a project initiated after the devastating earthquake of 1966, which actually destroyed a lot of Tashkent. And after this, a decision was taken that Tashkent should be built up into a model Soviet city. Well, what Soviet beauty have we uncovered here? The old Lenin Museum, which of course is no longer called the Lenin Museum. The street names are gone, the museum is gone. I mean, it's still here, but not in his name. And so are the Lenin statues. But nowadays, this is known as the State History Museum. But check out that incredible architecture. This would have opened back in 1970. And I've seen some old postcards of it from 1970, and I have to say it looked significantly nicer back then. But then again, look, the building is, what, 54 years old at this time? And that clock tower next to it, that must be from the USSR. I mean, absolutely has to be. So you know Uzbekistan's statehood, it charted a course very similar to that of the other Central Asian republics. So the story is not necessarily dissimilar to that of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, in that it was really the events of the Russian Revolution that propelled Uzbekistan into statehood. Now it doesn't achieve independence until 1991, but already in 1918, this entire area, this entire region, which would include modern-day Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan, is organized into a Turkestan autonomous republic within, well, what will become the Soviet Union in 1922. In 1924, Uzbekistan is already upgraded to the status of a Soviet socialist republic, so part of the Union. And actually, initially, Uzbekistan includes the territory of Tajikistan, which also has autonomy within it. Then later on, at the end of the 1920s, Tajikistan is granted full Union Republic status. And then later on in 1936, the last territorial changes occur. Basically, the area known as Karakalpakstan is moved from Russia to Uzbekistan. So nowadays, you actually have the Karakalpakstan autonomous region or republic within Uzbekistan. So the territory has really been unchanged since 1936. Well, Tashkent, what architectural marvel have you bestowed upon me now? And guess what period this is from? I don't want to say it again because I think I've already said the word about 16 times in this video and I swear we're just a few minutes in. Anyway, this is the exhibition hall of the Academy of the Arts. Well, we've discovered here a hero of not only Uzbekistan, but the Soviet Union, Vladimir Zhanibekov, a cosmonaut or astronaut who actually spent, I believe, 145 days in space. He flew on five different space missions for the Soviet Union, and actually from 1985 to 1990, he was a member of the Supreme Soviet of the Uzbek SSR. Now, he was actually not born in Uzbekistan, but grew up in Tashkent, and actually there was a planet named for him that was discovered in 1979. 
And here we have a little something dedicated to the cosmonauts of the Soviet Union more generally. Yeah, pretty incredible to think about the fact that the Soviets actually sent up astronauts from all across the Union. And not only that, they had something known as Intercosmos. So they actually sent up astronauts from a range of countries, including, well, East Germany, Afghanistan, Syria, the list goes on. So, you know, also speaks to the fact of this sort of internationalism and really the fact that there were significant technological and scientific advances that the Soviets were responsible for during the country's existence. Well, as time went on and the decades dragged on, Tashkent actually became the fourth largest city in the Soviet Union after Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. And what does every world-class Soviet city need? It needs a metro system. And considering how big the city is and the fact that it doesn't actually seem that walkable, thank goodness. But anyway, let's check out what the metro actually has to offer. I believe until a few years ago it was actually impossible to film in the metro in case or unless you wanted to do it illegally. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing we're here now in 2024. But I'm super excited for this metro station in particular, which is named for, surprise, surprise, the Cosmonauts. Alright, that was a little bit of a struggle to actually get into the metro, but now that we're here, let's check out what the Cosmonaut Station is all about. Oh, let's begin here. <laughs> yeah, the giddiness. Wow. Oh my goodness. What a wonder we have just discovered. It was actually one of my top things to do here in Tashkent. I mean, the metro in general, but this station in particular. Wow. Wow. All right, let's check out what the Uzbekistan station, I believe it's called, has to offer. The station has definitely been updated because here you have the seal of modern day Uzbekistan, the Republic of Uzbekistan, as opposed to the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. Well, that was interesting. I got told off for filming in the metro, even though it is apparently legal to do so. So when I said that I thought it was legal to film, he said, Well, you can film, just don't show any details. To which I was like, Bro. What is a metro without the details? Well, check it out. We've now discovered UFOs in three Soviet cities, Almaty, Bishkek, and now Tashkent. And considering the fact that we just saw that memorial to the cosmonauts, I'm beginning to think that unidentified flying objects were actually part of the Soviet space program. Well, 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 well. Yeah, we got the old cinema. <laughs> Whew! This is definitely something unique. And they say Soviet architecture was boring and dull and drab and... Ah, I don't agree with that at all. Well, another thing that we've seen in both the old Alma-Ata and Frunze, and now here in Tashkent, the Eternal Flame. The tribute to the 27 million Soviet citizens who died during the war including, I believe, an estimated 11 million Red Army troops. So, here we have it. So you have these books of Red Army 
soldiers who ended up perishing in the war, you know, among the 11 million Red Army combatants. So presumably, this is just the list of heroes from Uzbekistan during that time. You can see a lot of these people, I mean, born in, for example, this guy here, 1913 dies in 1942 so you know less than 30 years old but a lot of them significantly younger as well and it just goes on and on and on and on all right so i've already been told off in the metro for filming or rather the type of filming i was doing <laughs> let's see what happens here in the tv tower hopefully it's all good and i can come up in here no problem with my camera <laughs> well we are in no problem so photography and videos before security is a no-no after security no problem and what do we see here that's what I was just talking about. This is literally the view from my living room, the Berlin TV Tower, and a bunch of other TV towers all across the world. Man, this is this is better than I anticipated. Already starting off very strong, Tashkent. Even Blackpool gets a shout out next to Berlin. I mean, you can't really compare these two. No disrespect to anybody from Blackpool, but come on, man. I mean, to be fair, Montreal, should we really include you here? So the Tashkent TV Tower was conceived of, or they started construction in 1978, and they finished construction in 1985, one year after I was born. All right, we've made it to the observation deck. In the elevator, they have a video which basically shows you the elevator from underneath as it's making its way up. If you remember from Almaty, I'm terrified of heights. So that video, for me, not good, not good. Why is this a thing? Why? We started our day at this hotel and inevitably it's where we got to wrap up. But anyway, with that being said, plan is to get a little bit of rest and then I'll see you tomorrow, probably give you a room tour first thing as well. All right, let's see what tomorrow has to offer in Tashkent. Well, dobre utra, good morning. It's just gone 6.30 in the morning and what a time to actually wake up in Tashkent in January because the sun is rising. So I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. But first things first, I wanna show you what 48 US dollars more or less gets you in the old Soviet hotel. Now I'm here for five nights, so that comes to almost, what is it? It was like three million uh, Uzbek som. So quite a lot. The currency is a whole different situation. But uh, anyway, let me flip this around and let me show you what we're dealing with over here. All right, so first of all, yeah, this is your front door. You know, you come in and basically looks already quite spacious. You know, you got this little hallway right here. Got a few chairs, part of the mess, by the way. I've just pretty much stashed and dumped my stuff everywhere. Got a nice kind of uh, desk over here, you know, no extra chair for it, but I guess you can just use one of these two. And then, yeah, I mean, look at this. I don't know if you can get a sense of how spacious it is, but it's, it's quite big. Got a little fridge over here on this side. And then head into the bathroom, which is also ginormous, as they say. <laughs> I don't know who says that, to be fair, but um, yeah, nice Soviet bathtub. This is me over here on this side again, in case y'all missed me. And then, yeah, TV with mostly Russian channels. And then out here, ah yes, the grand, grand, grand sunrise. But check out the size of this balcony. I mean, it's absolutely enormous. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful Tashkent. What do you have in store for me today? All right, so the story of Soviet Uzbekistan is inextricably tied to a man by the name of Sharov Rashidov. Now, he was leader of the Uzbek SSR from 1959 to 1983. And in Russia today, he's probably most remembered for corruption. In Uzbekistan, he's known as being a national hero. And the reality is both are probably true. 
Now, Rashidov basically oversaw tremendous economic growth of Uzbekistan during his tenure in power. And we got to remember that this was a almost completely illiterate backward region when the Russian Revolution had broken out in 1917. So by the 1970s, I mean, Uzbekistan is really doing tremendously well in a lot of ways. At the same time, Uzbekistan was the primary cotton producer for the Soviet Union. And basically the central government in Moscow started demanding that more and more cotton be produced. Now, Uzbekistan was already suffering from, well, tremendous ecological problems related to trying to fulfill these quotas. And basically what they started to do is they started to lie about having fulfilled the quotas or even over fulfilling quotas and actually got more and more funds allocated to the Uzbek Republic from Moscow. Uh, in the end, a lot of these funds were siphoned off and the corruption was exposed in the early 1980s. It was Yuri Andropov when he was Soviet leader, I believe in 1983, who actually decided to finally tackle this head on. So in the last years of the USSR, Rashidov is not looked at very favorably, but he was rehabilitated during the independence or after the independence of Uzbekistan by Islam Karimov. All right, my party people, and by that I mean my Communist Party people, do you mind if we return to the metro this morning? I think I know the answer to this, but uh, I'm going to ask you anyway. I think we'll do that because we haven't seen a lot of the stations yet, and I think this is really the crown jewel of Soviet, you know, Tashkent, aside from the Hotel Uzbekistan. And we've already seen a lot of Leninist landmarks. Why not check out the Marxist metro? We'll check out this station in all of its glory. Wow. A little bit weary about filming in here after I got told off the other day for filming details. Um, but hopefully you can still spot all of the finer details because this station I think so far is my favorite. Even more so than the Cosmonaut station which I know that's, that's actually quite a big statement because that one just blew me away. Oh my goodness. So you remember the story about the cotton scandal? This is the station of cotton. <laughs> Check it out. Another unidentified stationary object. This is actually the cotton station, believe it or not. Wow, so we've come to a place called the Victory Park, which interestingly only opened in 2020. I say that because it commemorates the Soviet victory over the fascists in the Great Patriotic War, what a lot of us would refer to as World War II. And it's interesting because Uzbekistan played a very prominent role, as did all of the Soviet republics. And actually Uzbekistan, which had a total population of around six and a half million at the time, Time, around one and a half million of its people participated in the war. So nearly one in four Uzbeks basically at that time. And around 420,000 ended up actually dying in the war, which if you look at the casualty numbers from the Western countries, that's roughly the same amount of British people who ended up dying in the war and roughly the same amount of Americans as well. So it really underscores the just colossal casualty rate and sacrifice of the Soviet people during this particular time. I think it might be a little bit hard to see this because I'm even struggling myself, but this is something that's written in, well, Uzbek, English, and Hebrew. And actually it commemorates these several hundred thousand Jewish people who ended up finding refuge in Uzbekistan during the war. It also makes reference to the fact that around a million and a half people in general sought refuge in Uzbekistan. This was the period where basically a lot of the industries were also being evacuated 
located, uh, you know, further away from the front line. So to places like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Central Asia more generally. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. I'm just going to keep on saying that. I mean, this recreation of a, of a train station and the rail yard and all that. All right, so all of these tanks on display over here, but this is the one that I recognized immediately, the T-34, the main tank used by the Soviet military during the war. And actually, it was instantly recognizable to me, mostly because I live in Berlin, where the war, of course, ended. And actually, there's two T-34s sitting in front of the first Soviet war memorial that opened right after the war ended, basically in 1946. These tanks, by by the way, manufactured in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. And of course, victory is going to be due in the long run, not necessarily just because of military tactics and all the rest of it, but also morale. And what better way to actually keep up morale or try to boost morale than culture and songs and, you know, dance and, you know, basically living amongst the, the horrors of death. Check this out. This is without a doubt one of the most impressive things that I've ever seen in my life. It's a huge, huge, huge statement. I'm, I'm well aware of that. And you know, I live in Berlin. I, I live in the city where it all ended, you know, where the Soviet flag was hoisted over the Reichstag and where there's scores of, well, more than scores, there's, there's thousands of, you know, Soviet soldiers who are buried there, laid to rest. We have Treptor Park, for example, which I'll try to show you in a forthcoming video at some point. But this is, this is colossal this is huge and it, it's so like beautifully executed and laid out and also one thing that really strikes me about it is yeah it's from 2020 you know and there's a concerted effort here to you know on behalf of the current authorities to not minimize the past but to you know to, to glorify it and to remember it and to you know never lose sight of that so you know even just merely showing the hammer and the sickle even if it's meant to commemorate those who sacrificed their lives in the war that would be illegal in the Ukraine of today. So it's interesting to see here in Uzbekistan how they've decided to basically still uphold that part of their history. Well, here you actually have a list of all of the republics in the Union and their total population in 1940. So the Soviet population as a whole, 194 million roughly. And here you can see Uzbekistan actually had the fourth largest population at around, it says, six and a half million. You know, one thing that they mention in here is how Uzbek soldiers already played a very prominent role in the war from the very beginning, you know, basically in the days and weeks after Operation Barbarossa had been launched, you know, the surprise attack on the Soviet Union in June of 1941. So it wasn't as the war dragged on, they were an integral component of the fighting from the very beginning, really. So, you know, there were no lack of women from across the Union who actually fought in the Soviet Red Army or in partisan detachments. But also this particular part of the display, it pays tribute to the women and their organizing efforts behind the front line, basically, you know, away from the battlefield. Well, you know, as I leave the Victory Park, my mind is just racing. There's so many things that I'm thinking about, but I guess the main thing that sort of has been driven home is how much Uzbekistan has really not shied away from recognizing its Soviet heritage. And, you know, the hammer and sickles that are very clearly still on display here, I mean, that's just a sort of very obvious aesthetic testament to that. 
But it also got me thinking about how in 1991, this state became no more. I mean, the union went out of existence. And in early 1991, there was actually a referendum across much of the Soviet Union. And that referendum was on preserving the union. And it was actually in the Central Asian republics where people voted most decisively to remain. Actually, in Uzbekistan, something like almost 95% of people voted to remain part of a union. And actually, this was a period where, I mean, yeah, there were a lot of problems, I mean, to say the least. You know, by the mid-1980s, I think, you know, anybody looking at it could see there was a need for very substantial, serious reform in the USSR. I mean, the problems of corruption, like here in Uzbekistan, the problems of, you know, bureaucratism, the problems related to, you know, a very stuffy sort of political climate where it was very difficult to express dissent. All of these things were very real, the need for reform was certainly there. But actually people I think still did see that, you know, the socialist experience had given them a dignified life. It had given them access to, or the right to a job, the right to housing, to healthcare, to education, you know, to culture, to all of these things which, you know, previously had been considered almost unthinkable. So dignity really at the end of the day, which the Soviet experience did manage to actually provide, which has to be seen also, you know, all of those things as democratic rights in their own right. And actually the last 30 plus years, yeah, I don't know. What exactly has that, you know, show to the world in terms of what is possible or are we at the end of history as they say? I don't think so. So, you know, courage can take many different forms. And I guess the most obvious example of courage is what we were just talking about, the heroism of the Soviet citizens who gave their lives during the Great Patriotic War. But in addition to that, just to come full circle, we had the 1966 Tashkent earthquake. And this earthquake, which devastated so much of the city, well, it really saw the Soviet people once again banding together to help their brothers and sisters here in Tashkent. And actually, a lot of the fraternal public started not only well sending in aid and workers but actually taking families and basically housing them for a period while Tashkent was being rebuilt into this amazing city that we see today so I think this monument of courage here is a very sort of fitting way and a fitting place to end this tour of Soviet Tashkent well, we did it, everybody. We spent two amazing weeks on the road. We visited three incredible cities, Almaty, Bishkek, and Tashkent, and three countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And we were in search of, of course, you know, which city is the most quintessentially Soviet more than 30 years after the breakup of the USSR? And it's time for the rankings. And this probably won't surprise you if you've actually been watching all of the videos. I want to start with third place. Okay, third place... I would actually say Almaty. Now, Almaty is an incredible city, but I feel like compared to the other two, it is less Soviet in its appearance. I mean, we did spot quite a few Leninist landmarks and all of that good stuff, but no Lenin himself. All right, number two, Tashkent, I would say edges out Almaty by a little bit, and I think it's really just because of the metro system. The metro system propels it into that second position. And by a long shot, <laughs> in number one, Bishkek, the old Frunze. I mean, it is like stepping back in the USSR. That's the way that it feels. It feels as if you've been transported to 1989, 1990, before the fragmentation of the Union. Uh, so yeah, those three cities, look, all of them are incredible. I would say I didn't quite vibe with Tashkent the same way that I was anticipating. But nonetheless, uh, come to Central Asia, it's definitely a place where, you know, we're starting to see more, I guess, tourists flock to from the West, but still quite an underrated destination. Anyway, if you've enjoyed these videos, leave me a comment down below and let me know what you enjoyed and what I can do better. Because look, to be honest, we've just started this project and frankly, I still have no idea what I'm doing. Anyway, we got to get back to Western Europe. And as the old saying goes, all good things must inevitably come to their conclusion. See you on the other side.